Hi, everybody. I'm really happy to be here with all of you, and it's nice to be in a room full of like enthusiastic and interested uh, students. So Annette pretty much gave my, my speech away, but that's OK. Um, <clears throat> so <clears throat> me. Um, where should I start? I think that we all have passion inside of us, and um, something that we're always looking for is a way to find purpose for that passion. And mine began, so my parents tell me, when my mother was nine months pregnant with me, and she was taking uh, an opera class, and she was holding a score, and she doesn't remember what it was, but apparently this huge crescendo came up, and I kicked so hard with reaction to the music in the room that the score went flying off the page. And um, her instructor said, hey, you've got a conductor in there. <laughs> Um, so now fast forward, I was born in, uh, in downtown Detroit, and um, there weren't a lot of um, things for a, uh, uh, the arts weren't, weren't really prevalent as they are now, like in Cleveland, there are so many opportunities for you. And um, I went to, you all know that there's like a, a car that's a company called Chrysler. So um, I went to Walter P. Chrysler Elementary School, which is like right in downtown Detroit. And um, when I was seven years old, the Detroit Symphony came to our school and played in our auditorium. And they asked a whole, and I remember this very clearly, they asked this whole room full of you know, babies, I mean, how old were we, between the ages of five and 10? Um, who wants to conduct? Well, I mean, you ask any group of small children who wants to do something, and everyone is gonna say, I wanna do it. Um, uh, and none of us really knew what that meant, but for some reason, I was chosen. And I ran up there, and the conductor at the time, you know, handed, I don't remember who it was, um, handed me the baton, and was like, ooh, wow. So I, you know, I jumped up on the podium, and all I remember was this sound pouring over me, something that I had never experienced before. And if any of you, how many of you are musicians in here? Woohoo! Yeah. Okay, so you can imagine. Um, standing in the center of all of that sound. If you've never stood on a podium before, it's something that you should ask Mr. McDougall if you can do. Um, and just being completely enveloped by all of that oxygen and all of that life force. And this is something that rolled over me as I was seven years old. And um, of course, I don't Obviously, I wasn't conducting them, they were leading themselves, but I certainly felt like I had some control over what was happening. And <clears throat> I went home that day and, and told my parents that I wanted to play the violin, which I think is a little strange because like, I remember feeling all of this energy to the right where the cellos and the violas are. I'm a violist now, uh, but uh, I call myself a recovering violinist. And, <laughs> And, um, but I think that's just the instrument that I do. And it seemed like forever until I finally got one in my hands, but my grandfather was on the phone with my dad and overheard my asking him again for an instrument. And the next day, like, of course, you know, your grandfather's gonna hear that you wanna play the violin. It's gonna appear at your door the next day. Um, so um, I, I studied in the, in the public schools and um, didn't start private lessons until um, probably I was in middle school and I started studying with um, some members of the Detroit Symphony. But there weren't any outlets for young musicians at that time, like youth orchestras weren't popular then. And so I just sort of felt myself, um, not like, uh, yeah, just directionless. I couldn't figure out what to do with this passion that I had. And how could I harness this passion? And my parents, as, as I shared with you, my parents um, sent me to um, Interlochen Arts Academy, um, which is a boarding high school in Northern Michigan. And it was a great experience. I mean, imagine being in, like, in the woods with 400 other teenagers. Um, <laughs> that are all of the creatives of uh, creative mind, uh, mindset. And, um, but even while I was there, the things that they said that I could do as a violinist were I could either be in a professional orchestra or I could teach in the public schools. Both professions, which I have an enormous amount of respect for, but knew then that they weren't the right direction for me. But they didn't send, they, even at this 
focused art school, uh, they still didn't help me find a direction that suited who I was, which made me feel uh, almost more lost than I was before I went there. And I um, ended up in Cleveland uh, because my teacher there wanted me to study with a man named Eric Eichhorn, who was a George Zell hire, who was, uh, he was, uh, he was director of the Cleveland Orchestra for forever and was sort of responsible for that Cleveland Orchestra sound. Um, so I ended up in Cleveland and um, studied with him. And while, and I still felt sort of directionless because I still had this passion, but I didn't know what the purpose of that passion was and how to find that direction. And um, I started making things up in my head like, okay, I'm gonna record all of Bach's solo uh, partitas and sonatas for violin, but I'm gonna add a bass and I'm gonna add a drum set because that's what Bach would do if he were alive today. <laughs> But it was something different, right? It was something that, that I sort of had control over that I wanted to do um, with music. Um, and then we, I was in, I was an undergrad and uh, the orchestra conductor made an announcement to us that a local music school um, was looking for a violin teacher and they were paying $8.50 an hour and I, my hand was up, I am so there. And um, I was hired, and I was 18 years old. And <clears throat> everything changed for me at that moment because I realized that part of the purpose of my passion was to teach. And even though it was confusing to me because I had dismissed going into the public schools, but um, this one-on-one -on -one relationship with students that I had and to be able to help guide them and give them a sense of um, accomplishment was really quite satisfying. And um, uh, I probably wasn't very good at it at the time, but I sure did enjoy what I was doing. And <clears throat> uh, what ha happened after that is I ended up being a gopher for a local music school's small youth orchestra. And um, it was a youth orchestra that was maybe about 50 kids, <clears throat> and uh, someone else was conducting, and the gopher meaning like I would go copy music, or I would like walk around and, and help the kids with fingerings and bowings and, you know, play demonstrations, and um, about two, and I was in the, I was doing that for about a year and a half, and um, about two weeks before a performance, um, he uh, had to leave the school, he and his uh, wife were moving, and he handed me the stack of, of music and said, I gotta go, here. And I was standing there with like this stack of music, these scores, and the school didn't have anyone else to do it because I had been there and been involved in this. So I stepped up on the podium and, oh, there was that sound, you know? And the thing is, is that um, I had no idea if it was very good or not. I just know how great it made me feel. And what happened is all of a sudden this passion that I had, all of it, there was like this purpose to this passion. And I wanted to be everything that I could be. And I wanted to be the best teacher that I possibly could be. And Boy, that came with a lot of mistakes. <laughs> and um, you, you try and you fail and, and you learn from these. Um, and I just, I find that, that like teaching and music and medicine and all of these, these other wonderful uh, um, careers and paths, you never stop learning. It's not like you stop. Like I've learned everything, I know everything. I've been conducting for 25 years at this point. Now insert surprise. Um, and uh, there's still so much more to learn. Um, but I discovered at that point that, oh my, uh, oh my goodness, I want to be a youth orchestra conductor. And I was, you know, I was 19 and a half years old and, and there it was in my lap. And there was passion turning into purpose. And I realized also at that point that I had no interest in using the youth orchestra as a stepping stone to get to the professional orchestra level, that I was super happy where I was. So um, I stayed there for five years, 
and um, developed an orchestra camp. And, well, it was a string camp and then um, developed it into an orchestra camp. And so I was busy year round and um, honing my craft, even though I didn't realize that's what I was doing. But I was becoming not just a better teacher, but I was becoming a better administrator and I was becoming a better conductor and I was becoming a better communicator. Um, my instrument, I became stronger on my, on my instruments because I was talking about it in detail throughout. So I hopefully was inspiring my students to continue to work and be the best that they could be. But there was still something missing and I didn't know what it was. And granted, at this point, I'm in my early 20s. <clears throat> and um, then uh, a man named Dr. Bernard Rands came to town. And um, he, at the time, was the uh, 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 composer in residence with the Philadelphia Orchestra. And he was the composition, one of the composition professors at uh, Harvard. And, um, he was being brought in by another local orchestra in town to do a conference on contemporary music. And they needed a youth orchestra to demonstrate on how children could access new music. And so they came to me um, for some reason and said, can we use your you know, little orchestra to demonstrate? I'm like, sure. So uh, Dr. Rams sent me, because this is before cell phones and email, sent me his score in the mail, and it was like filled with all these notes and, and weird graphs, and I didn't understand what it was. So I just didn't do anything with it. And being naive is a wonderful thing sometimes. And I just left it, and I didn't do a thing with it. And then Dr. Rance shows up to rehearsal, and he says, oh, he's, he's English and so lovely. And he said, oh, I can't wait to hear what you've done with this. And I was like, well, I haven't done anything with it because I don't really understand it. Um, so as an educator, he sat down with me and, you know, spent, I have no idea how long, five or ten minutes with me, and explained it to me. And I could explain it all to you right now, that if it was a thinner line and it got a little bit darker and lighter, obviously the sound was supposed to mimic that. Um, and I understood what that was, and I think you understand what I'm explaining to you as well. So it was really personal interpretation based on a piece of art that you were looking at. So he said, why don't you run the rehearsal? Let me see what you do with it. And again, being naive was so great. It's like, oh, sure, I'll do that. So I did it, and then he did it as well so that I could learn from him. Then move on to the um, uh, actual performance, and he said, why don't you run it in front of all these people? <laughs> okay, I'll do that because, again, naive. Um, so, and I guess naive makes, makes you uh, have a sense of um, no fear. Is, is really what I'm getting at with this. And uh, so I did it, and I'm sure you all have had a teacher or a parent or a friend or someone who you look to who has said something really positive to you that could have potentially changed your life or changed your outlook or changed how you think about things or made you make a decision that you didn't realize that was the right thing for you to do. At the reception, and, and Bernard Rands is that man for me and that person for me. Because at the reception after this, he pulled me aside and he said, you have an ability to hear and teach this music and I think you should start a youth orchestra. I'm like, what? <laughs> you crazy? You start a youth orchestra? What are you talking about? I'm so happy where I am because I developed this program and I was really happy. I thought I was really happy. Um, and he said, I really think you should think about this. Passion, passion, the purpose, the purpose of this passion. Where am I trying to go with this? What am I trying to do that isn't what I'm doing right now? But I'm so happy on the podium of a youth orchestra. This is so great. So I took a year to think about it. And I started playing with names. And I don't know what, how, how you end up developing thought and content, but I, sometimes, I usually start with the name. So um, all of a sudden I came up with this name, Contemporary Youth Orchestra. Well, there's not another one anywhere that just, as, as, as you heard, um, that just does new music. So with $400 in my pocket and some uh, uh, parents in my private studio that were attorneys that helped me become uh, a nonprofit organization and helped me uh, uh, copyright the name, I started the orchestra with um, 35 members. Um, 
and wow, okay, so my passion is turning into this purpose here to expose students to the infinite possibilities of new music. So that was 23 years ago. And what has happened in those 23 years is CYO has evolved into an orchestra and a chorus and a chamber music program and a master class series. And um, we have become an orchestra that, that is not just focused on contemporary music, but is focused on offering our students um, opportunities to learn of all the different potential professions that they can have in the entertainment industry. So they learn about entertainment law. All these classes we're forming uh, to start next year, like in, in earnest. So entertainment law and media and marketing and lighting design and stage design and recording and photography and videography and composition, all of these different things that make an, uh, a, a show happen. And so where is the passion and where is the purpose in this? The purpose in this for me is to make sure that my students have the confidence to create their own careers, to be independent thinkers, and to be comfortable with the decisions that they make for themselves. And how is that possible through an orchestra? Well, if you think about this through new music, you don't have the opportunity to listen to a recording and say, I have to play it just like that, instead, which is fine. But instead, you have to rely on your own instincts and your own choices and decision making to bring to life something that has not been brought to life before. And whether or not you go into music or any of the other entertainment fields that, that we're exposing you to, you are going to be able to apply that to everything else in your life because that confidence has been instilled in you and the orchestra is just the vehicle to get you there. Um, one of uh, my favorite moments um, is uh, seeing the faces of my students when they accomplish something or when they know that they can raise their hand in rehearsal and say, can we try this phrase like this? Because in order for music to be um, owned, for you to own your art, you have to have a say in it as well. And so to create that atmosphere where there's comfort to be able to have a say in the interpretation is magic because you're going to be able to take that elsewhere. Um, so my passion was turned into purpose to help my students find purpose for their passion. And um, at season 20, the end of season 20, of CYO. Um, <clears throat> I, most of you probably will not know this group, but there's, a, there's, a, there's an old rock group called Crosby, Stills, and Nash. And um, Graham Nash was our um, guest artist. And i would known him for a, for a while. I've met him through some friends and have been asking him for years to do this show with us. And he um, has written a lot of music about social activism and social issues. And a lot of his songs were based, that we did in the concert, were based on these things that he's been talking about since the 60s that are still relevant today. And um, he did our, close, our closing show for, our, for season 20 with us. And um, afterwards, I got my first tattoo with, with him. And it was his writing that I had on my body. And some of you may know, um, and I'll tell you what this is, but some of you may know his song, Teach. Teach Your Children Well, um, which is one of his most famous songs. And um, so I had Teach written on my baton hand in his handwriting. And what it does is it sits here and reminds me that first and foremost in my life when I'm on that podium, that that is my purpose. Thank you.